Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles, and welcome back to another full card breakdown. This time for UFC Vegas 86, we have ourselves Hermanson versus Pfeiffer in what is a very, very fun middleweight bout in our main event. But not only that, we have ourselves 14 bouts this Saturday, a lot of fights to cover, and a lot of fights to look to navigate through from both a betting and a drafting perspective. As always, we're going to cover this from top to bottom, we're going to figure out where we can find some spots to hopefully make some money. Last week, we did manage to come out in the green, make some good DraftKings reads, thanks a lot in part to Charlie Radke and not a Moicano, but here we're looking to find those players. We're going to break down everything here, hopefully try to keep it condensed. It should all be timestamped down below for your viewing pleasure, as well as having a best bets video out later in the week. With all that out of the way, hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel, show some love, and let's do this. We get the night started with the 15-0 Daniel Marcos versus the 25-11 Arichi Lang. And what is a pretty fun striking affair? That's really what it's going to come down to. And a lot of these times when we have ourselves a striking affair, Daniel Marcos is going to be a guy you're going to look to get behind, and the money line kind of reflects it that way. He is a large favorite in this spot, and I tend to agree. When comparing these two, they both seem to be primary strikers. The difference is Marcos is a phenomenal kickboxer, whereas Arichi Lang, although a competent striker in his own right, he can lose minutes. I don't think he has that same power. He is more so boxing-oriented, and I do think when it comes down to just comparing people your precision, power, and output, it's going to come down to Daniel Marcos here. Now, from a macro perspective, looking back at it from a whole, Mar Marcos is a guy who I thought lost to Grant. I bet Grant against him. It doesn't matter here. I can't really compare these two because I do think it's a step down from Davey Grant and a guy in Richie Lang who doesn't really grapple that much. Although he's a competent striker who is pretty durable, does tire out in the third round, doesn't have that same amount of output, and will give Marcos the fight he wants. I think what we're looking at with seeing this fight goes down, Richie Lang might keep it close early, but does tend to fade down the stretch. I do think that the precision, the body work, the technicality, and just the constant output from Marcos should lead him to victory, whether it be a third round stoppage or a finish. I am like him to get it done this week. Draftings wise, though, it's kind of tricky because he's 9.3K and he doesn't have grappling equity. Arichi Lang's only been knocked out once, although it was in the first round, it was only once. So without much finish or grappling upside, is he going to live up to his 9.3K price tag? I don't necessarily think so. And for that same reason, it's hard for me to get to him at 9.3. Like I said, I do think he has some later finish upside, but. You know, he put up 104 in a second round victory against Oliveira. Does he put up that much in a third round victory? I'm not necessarily sure. So at 9.3, I do think there are some better options. You know, I do think some other fighters in this card may finish more often than not. So I'm not necessarily getting to Marcos in GPP, although I do think he's there a good option in cash if you do have a large portfolio. I do think he'd be a good contrarian play, but I am picking him to win this fight a lot of the time. Flip side of things, although Richie Lang can keep it close, I don't see him knocking out Marcos. I don't see him grappling him, and I really don't see him winning a lot of the time, so I'm not getting to him all that much. It does really stem towards, I do think Marcos wins this fight at a high clip, whether it be late finish, whether it be a decision, I do think it's his world, and it's another step for him for his undefeated record. Speaking of undefeated record, 8-0 Hyder Emil versus 10-4 Fernie Garcia. Fernie Garcia getting his fourth shot here after going 0-3 in the UFC, whereas Hyder Emil coming off that Dana Wake and Henry Sears performance. Wonder why I bet him. And, uh, you know, he got the fight he wanted. He got himself an extended striking affair. He is a guy who likes to push past that cardio barrier. Isn't the best technically, isn't the best grappler, but wants to win. And he'll go out there and he'll push himself to the limit. Great cardio, great output, great volume. And he'll look to drown his opponents. Fernie Garcia, a guy who... You know what, man? I, I think has his flaws. He has not found his footing in the UFC. I do think he is a decent, powerful striker, I do, as well as being extremely durable, but he, he lacks the ground game I'd like to see. I don't think he has as much volume here. And I think when it comes down to comparing this fight as a whole, the winner I'm going to have to pick here is going to be Hyder at Meal. Not because he's going to get the fight he wants, but because when it comes down to comparing win upside, I do think the better minute win here is, is Hyder at Meal. Despite having the best, you know what, technicality, he will push a pace, he will win the volume metrics, and I do think he will push Garcia to his limits. However, I will admit, as someone who loves Hyder and Emil in his style, this is not a matchup I want to back him in. I think although Fernie Garcia is being overlooked this week, he's going to finally get a matchup he, did, he wants here, one where there's not going to be much grappling, one where he's able to contend in the striking. And I do think this fight's going to be a lot closer than people expect it to be. I think Fernie Garcia himself is going to be able to land a guy in Hyder and Emil who doesn't have the best striking defense and who looks to beat people by having superior cardio. I think he has superior cardio. I think he wins, but I do think rounds one, rounds two potentially are going to be very, very close. One where Garcia could potentially have a better chance to win than the line and tails. I am picking Hyder Emil. I do think he gets it done, but Fernie Garcia is a very, very sneaky underdog this week, and I do think he should have a better chance to win than the line and tails, just because I don't see Hyder Emil going out there styling on, styling on him technically or using grappling success to, to win at a high clip. So if that's the case, if I don't see Hyder Emil wrestling too much or I don't see him getting too much of a finish here, especially considering how tough Fernie Garcia is, Although I'm picking him, I don't want him too much on DraftKings, and there are going to be better options. And I'd almost rather have Ferdinand Garcia. If Hyder Mills is going to make him fight at a very, very high pace, 
Garcia's going to be able to contend. And I do think for round one and two, he's going to be able to contend in the striking for sure. If he survives to get the decision win, I think he'll be a very, very low underdog with potential to have a volume upside and a decent score at his price tag. So there are no salaries yet, but I do think he could be a live underdog this week. Again, I'm picking a mill. Gun to my head, he's my pick, but value-wise, it's all Garcia, which is insane to say because I have made a lot of money betting against Garcia and I made money betting on a mill. I just don't think this is the right stylistic matchup for him to absolutely obliterate his opponent, but I am still picking him to get it done. Should be actually a pretty fun one. Next up, 6-2 and two, Zach Pauga versus 14-3 and three, Bogdan Guskov. This fight is so binary. It's so, well, it's not easy to pick, but it's easy to break down. And that's just going to be, we have ourselves a point fighter, a guy who is pretty well-rounded, pretty solid everywhere the fight goes, versus a round one power threat in Bogdan Guskov. Guskov's a guy who likes to go out there, all of his wins are a finish, 100% finish rate, extremely powerful, extremely dangerous, and I think if there's a finish materializing early, it's going to be the bugged on Guskov side. If you tell me Guskov goes out there, knocks out Zach Pauga's lights early on, I'm not surprised one bit. But when it comes down to the better overall fighter, the guy with the better overall skill set, the guy who I think is a better mixed martial artist, it's Zach Pauga. I think he has better minute winning equity, I think he's able to push people up on the fence, has a decent overall top control game, shall it go there? And I do think he is the way more tested guy with skills in all areas, whereas Gusloff just has that right hand, Pauga can at least strike from range, win minutes, and all that stuff. The problem with Pauga is he's not a power threat. He couldn't even finish Jordan Wright. He's a guy who likes to win minutes, and it's going to allow for 15 minutes for Gusloff to try to find that off switch. Now, now, like I said, I'm not surprised if Guskov founds it, but I am going to pick Pauga here. I think he has more ways he's going to get done. Although he was knocked out by Usman, and it is a path for Guskov, more time than not, I think Pauga has success. We've seen Guskov taken down and dominate on the mat. We've seen him crumble up to the first line of resistance, and we've seen him face a very, very low level of competition. I think Zach Pauga will try to drag him into deep waters, and if this fight hits round two or three, it's Pauga's world. Give me Zach Pauga. Like I said, KO1 equity is there for Bogdan, so that's completely a possibility, but... Overall, the guy who I see winning more time than not is Pauga. Better well-versed game, and I do think it's his hand raised. DraftKings-wise, though, Guskov is a phenomenal GPP play. 7.8K if he wins. It's probably around 1K. It's probably scoring 100, 110. That is a very good option. However, sneakily, DraftKings sneaky is Zach Pauga this week. 8.4K. No one likes to play him. I mean, in his winning list, we're 74. He is a decision machine. But I'm telling you, the way that Guskov gives up, the way that we've seen him taken down and controlled in the mat, there are paths for Pauga to get finishes, and there are paths for him to score very, very well. So a very, very sneaky option. Not the most trustworthy play, but at 8.4K, I'm taking a shot at GPP. I do think he has more upside than people are going to think this week, and it could be a sneaky option to get you to the top. Next up, the 12-3-1 Jeremiah Wells, 19-10 Max Griffin. This seems to be the talk of the town this week. Max Griffin is extremely popular underdog. Everyone loves him. His line's being bet down, and you know what? I completely see why. He is going to be the larger dude, more battle-tested, a ton of UFC experience, and he seems to have a pretty, pretty good minute-winning ability in the spot. Jeremiah Wells, although extremely explosive, is more of the moment winner here. He's a guy who can land those blast doubles, who can crack the chin. He is extremely dynamic. When you're comparing a complete moment winner versus a minute winner, and the minute winner has not been knocked out really, aside from ground and pound beat down to Colby Covington, I understand why people are assuming that Griffin can go out there, outpoint Jeremiah Wells with, with his Ranger tools to win a decision. I completely understand if you're betting Griffin, I don't mind it here. But as the line gets closer, I'm starting to picture this fight as a whole. And when it comes down to potential physicality and grappling strength or, or winning the minutes or having more finish upside, I, I do think Wells has that in his side here. I, I think that he was able to go out there and control Harris last time, a fight where he did drop the ball, but I think that he was able to show good grappling control. His cardio is in question, but he has shown the ability to land takedown sporadically. He has shown the ability to go out there and be a physical specimen, push people up against the cage, as well as show really, really good power on the feet. I do think he win win moments enough to seal this fight. Now, Am I saying that with utmost confidence? Probably not. I'm not going to go out there and bet Jeremiah Wells unless he turned into a big underdog here, but I do think, gun to my head, I'm going to side with Wells here. DraftKings-wise, though, both these guys are viable, right? Wells for that finish up, so that takedown upside at 8.5K. He has always been a phenomenal DraftKings play, and his winning score 104, 102, 110, and 96. He's a guy who you can get behind to, to score pretty well, have that high ceiling, but if I'm saying that Griffin is going to be bet down potentially to a favorite, he's a guy who people see winning a lot of the time, as an underdog 7.7, there is some value there. He is a guy who does have the ability to go out there and score 92 like he did against Amabayev or score 84 like it against Means. As an underdog who has a very, very solid chance of winning, he is a very popular play this week. And in cash, I completely get it as well. Maybe not the most GP upside because he will be popular this week and Wells is pretty tough. But I do think he has a pretty high 
but I do think it's a pretty safe high floor play and he is someone who is going to be pretty popular. I like both sides this week, both for their own reasons. However, at the end of the day, gun to my head, I am picking Jeremiah Wells in what is a very, very close fight. Next up, 14 and 8, Devin Clark, 16 and 7, Marcin Prakniao. And man, I don't want to go anywhere near this fight. Both guys completely untrustworthy. Marcin Prakniao is a, a very powerful striker, but he can be taken down. And that's really the avenue I see for Devin Clark this week. Devin Clark is a guy who has shown they really go out there, land takedowns, be really good in top position, have a good clinch game, and be have some pretty good ground and pound as well. And I do think he's going to have that advantage over Marcin Prakniao. However, both these guys are not trustworthy at all. I've seen Devin Clark put himself in some precarious situations that he should not be in. I've seen him give up in some fights. And I've seen Marcin Prakniao transform into a horrible striker who's been round one KO'd in a lot of these spots to a serviceable fighter who will do whatever it takes to win the fight. So at the end of the day, the pick is Devin Clark. I do think he wins this fight a lot of time with that grappling success, but I'm not betting on Devin Clark's fight IQ. If he shows and wants to strike, I do think Prakniao is the superior striker of the two, allowing for me just to kind of want to stay away from this one. I do think Devin Clark's a rightful favorite. I do think he wins this fight a lot of the time. However, I do not want to get behind by this heavy price tag. I do think there are better ways to bet this card, and I'm not really trusting Devin Clark the best of my abilities. DraftKings wise, though, I do think he's very, very live because at 8.9K, he has that takedown, that finish upside possibility that could allow him to go out there and have some success. He's landed 28 takedowns in his career. He has the ability to go out there and have some success doing so. Scored a 107 in a round 3K overnight where he did land a couple takedowns. He can have some good drafting success. And if his path to victory is revolving around takedowns and ground pound and potentially finishes, he could score it very well at a GP option at 8.9K. Flip side of things, Marcin Prakniao, I, I don't really know because he doesn't really have much grappling upside. He's content to be a low volume striker. I'm not really getting too much 7.3K. I guess he could be a GP option if he were to knock out Devin Clark, but... When have you really seen that? I think Devin Clark has more upside in this spot, and he will be my preferred side on DraftKings and the guy I'm picking to get it done on Saturday. Next up, 8-3, Loma Lagunmi versus the 9-3-1 Bruna Brazil. Fun fight, actually. Actually, I'm looking forward to this, but we do have Loma Lagunmi as a big favorite. I tend to agree. Bruna Brazil is coming off a win. We'll give her that here, but I do think Loma Lagunmi is one of my favorite underrated women's fighters. Uh, she's got an incredible Muay Thai clinch game. She is very small, so often underrated, but she's working on that wrestling. She's working on those trips, and she has such a good fundamental knowledge of the sport of Muay Thai and how to translate that to MMA and has had success because of it. I love her kicks. I love her dexterity and I love her ability to work in the clinch as well as the Muay Thai clinch and have some success there. And I do think she's going to have the advantage to go out there and beat Bruna Brazil. Now, out at range, uh, the size of Brazil and her ability to have some pretty straight punches could allow her to have some success, but in close, in the clinch, uh, with the trips and the take on upside and the overall improving wrestling game of Loma, I think Loma, as soon as she closes the distance, is a real problem here, and she should win this fight a lot of the time. With the kicks, the trips, the top control, like I mentioned, I do think she is a fighter who I, who I think the line's justified around, and I do think she wins this fight here a lot of the time. Now, here's the problem. Is Loma, as much as I love her, is, is not the biggest finish threat. She has never scored above 94 points on DraftKings. She is a typical decision machine, but 9.4K this week. It's really tough for me to go out there and get her. I do not think I can pay up to get her at all in single entry just because there are so many better options and there aren't that many underdogs I like to allow me to get to her in too many lineups. I think look, Boonmi is more than content and typically is going to go out there and get an 80 point victory, which I'll power to where I think she does that here, but I, that's not winning you any money at, at 9.4k on DraftKings. So I prefer other options. I can't get to her that often and uh, I will probably go otherwhere. However, if you do have a large portfolio and you're looking to sprinkle it in, she could be a good dart throw just because like I said, trips, takedown potential. I do think she'd do a lot of her work in close. So she it could be a very, very sneaky play to sprinkle in there, potentially be like a low owned pivot up top off of the more popular Rodriguez and Protest. So again, not really getting to her, prefer the people around her. Overall, a fight I'm not really getting too involved in. I do think Lukbuni wins though, and I do think she uh, covers her price tag. I love the way she fights and I think she gets her hand raised. Next up, 8-1 Timothy Kuamba versus the 8-1 Balaji Oki. This is the reason the video is late this week. I was waiting for this fight to be announced, and it is. Oki was originally supposed to fade Hasevic, was a massive favorite in doing so at 9.5, and uh, short on his replacement. And uh, it's a battle between a guy in Kuamba who I bet against versus a guy in Oki who I bet on on the Noah Kender series. Now, with that in mind, you think I'm probably pretty high on Oki and probably pretty low on Kuamba. Out of the blue, right off the bat here, I'm picking Timothy Kuamba. As an underdog pick, I will be betting it. I'm surprised at the way this line plays out. Now, there are many things to factor in here. First of all, I'm a bit afraid by locking the bet. I haven't done so yet just because it's up weight on short notice for Kwamba. He just fought last weekend. But I do think when it comes to co uh, to comparing skill sets, although Oki had a ton of success walking forward, utilizing athleticism last time, 
I think there's flaws in his game. He can be hit, he can be countered, he can be taken down to the mat and exploited. I do think the ground game is not the best. And although he is extremely powerful and can let off bombs again along the fence, he can be outpointed. I haven't seen his cardio tested too much and I don't like his ground game. So, so if all these things are stuff on my list, can Kwamba check those boxes? Can Kwamba wrestle? Can he push a high pace? Can he contend in the striking as well? He can do those things. And although he's coming up a, a weight class on short notice, I like his hunger. I like his ability to shoot takedowns and I like his ability to win fights. I mean, it was a very, very close fight with Vogel. I picked Vogel against him and he showed the ability to, to win moments and overall win the fight. As his light comes in and hits me in the eyes and I'm ducking below it, I think Kwama ducks below a couple of those power shots, take Oki down and exploits him on the mat. No salary out on DraftKings, but there's no denying that Kwama will be the preferred side. As an underdog, he'll be one of my favorite underdogs this week. A risky one at that because like I said, Oki's extremely powerful and could clip Kwama early, but I do think he has graphing upside. I do think he has wrestling upside. I do, I do think he wins this fight a lot more than the line entails. At 9.5K, Oki's a guy I can't really get behind. I'm not picking him, and yet he's the most expensive fighter on the slate. It's tough for me to want to back Oki. Similar to Luke Boonmi, if you have a high portfolio, he could be a low-owned pivot up top because he could have some early success early on, but not a guy I'm getting towards. I do think I'm picking Kwamba here. I know I'm picking Kwamba here, and I do think he's a guy I'm looking to roster on DraftKings. It's a lot of faith to put in a guy going up a weight class against a physical specimen like Oki, but I do think Kwamba has the skills to get it done. I'm putting my faith in the short notice guy, both on DraftKings and at the betting line. Next up, 16 and five, Trevin Giles versus the 17 and six, Carlos Parates. And I don't know if you guys remember, some of you may not even follow me on Twitter, but if you do, a week and a half ago, I put out a tweet saying, I wanna lay the hammer on somebody. I have a big bet I wanna make, typically I would, a bit more tentative. I laid the hammer and it's on this spot right here. Carlos Protes, four units, minus 200. I do think that Protes wins this fight at a high clip and I do really, really like his skill set. He's getting the Officer Giles test here this week. He's getting a guy who has fought the best of the best, you know, Dulitze, Duplessis, Michael Morales. People have fought Giles recently and not always have they passed the test, but he's become a gatekeeper and one with a really, really good overall skill set. He's very well-rounded. And I think that, I think overall there are worlds where Protes could be beat but I don't think it happens all too often in this spot here. Yes, Giles is a good wrestling. We haven't really seen Protez wrestled or, or succeed too much in the wrestling, but I think when it comes to a game at range, I love Protez's ability to use his reach advantage. He keeps opponents in of his punches. He has phenomenal power in both the hands and the feet, incredible striking accuracy. He likes his ability to string together combinations as well. And he breaks his opponents down the stretch. I, I love the striking I saw from him. He really, really impressed me. And although he's making his debut, he has fought some solid competition in the regional scene as well. That makes me believe he will have some success here. Giles may have the opportunity to go out there and, and wrestle and, and pose problems early, but I, I think Protez is working with the right camp to be able to get up and succeed on the feet. He has a reach advantage, the power advantage, the technicality advantage and the striking accuracy that I think is gonna cause Giles problems. The same way Morales was able to take advantage of Giles on the feet, I think Protest is able to melt him, end the punches. And I, I do think this kid's really special here. Protest is a very, very phenomenal striker and, and I was extremely impressed on tape. Laid the hammer, played him big. He is one of my favorite fighters and to, to look out for here. And I do think he gets a big win to jumpstart his career. Now, as a whole, I think it's a fight you want to target, right? I just mentioned Protest is going to have some striking success. I do think he gets a knockout in the spot. I do think he is just so crisp and able to take advantage of a fighter in Giles who has looked a bit slower against Parsons, barely able to win against Kosi there. I don't think Giles is that same dynamic fighter he used to be. I think Protest took advantage of that. At 9.2K, I'm fully willing to bank on striking accuracy, knockdown upside, finish upside. I do like him a lot more than Luke Boonmi, Marcos, and Oki above him. But as much as I'm talking about uh, Protez here and how he wins and how he's a better striker, what's the path to victory for Giles? How does Protez lose this fight? Takedowns, control time, and ground success for Giles. And I think that that path to victory at 7K scores phenomenal. I'm not picking Giles to win this fight very often. I think it's very, very low percentage outcome here. But when he does, he will score well. I'm on this fight as a whole, mostly from the Protez side, but I do think Giles is a very, very sneaky underdog just because when Protez loses, the opponent is probably going to score very well. So, I mean, Protest here, much better striker. I love the kid. I do think he's be something special. I laid the hammer on him, but uh, I do like this fight as a whole on DraftKings. On to the main card, 9-2, and Rodolfo Vieira, 8-2, and two, Armin Petrosian. We've talked about this fight already. We've already broken it down. I'm going to keep this one short and sweet. Rodolfo Vieira, better grappler. Armin Petrosian, better striker. I typically lean towards a grappler, and I'm doing that again here. There is completely a world where Petrosian is able to get up from a first takedown and outstrike Vieira, knock him out rounds two or three, completely see that happening. But 
I do think gun to my head if you ask me to pick a winner here is Vieira. We've seen Petrosian knocked down by a gust of wind. Although he has not been submitted, Vieira is a completely different level down there. He has shown phenomenal back takes, good takedowns early on, and he is just the black belt hunter. He is an extremely good grappler, and I do think he is able to have some ground success here. Of course, the cardio is a concern, the strike is a concern, but I do think Vieira, with the poor takedown of Petrosian, is able to have some success. I'm picking him here. Either way, though, on DraftKings, although the fight was canceled last time and broke our heart, I'm going right back to it. 8.2, 8K, you can fit both the men. I like Vieira, do that round one sub upside. Scored 106 in that first round round one sub he had. Um, I, I do think he's able to do that again here. High ceiling, 8.2K, I like him. But if you're on the Petrosian side, if you think he's able to uh, fend off some takedowns, get some knocked on upside, this fight should end early. I do think it's going to be a very entertaining affair, and I am liking both sides of DraftKings. More so the Vieira side, he will be my pick here, but a very fun fight. I just hope it happens this time. Moving on, 21 and 19, Michael Johnson versus the 12, 6 and 1, Darius Flowers. Friend of the show, we had Darius Flowers on the show before Dana White Contender Series appearance. He talked the talk and he, he walked the walk with a, a pretty impressive showing here. And uh, this is another one that's a very, very, uh, let's say popular topic of debate this week. Michael Johnson has been around forever, has beaten some incredible names himself, uh, but you know, he's getting up there, uh, almost has a 500 record. He has shown the ability to lose fights. Knocked out cold by Ferreira last time, dropped a close one to Malarkey, was knocked out cold iconically by Josh Emmett. You know what, there, there are some flaws in Michael Johnson's game, but I do think he's getting a, a fighter a bit below his, his skill pedigree. I mean, when you're going out there and you're comparing Diego Ferreira, Mark Casey, Jamie Malarkey, Clay Guida to Darius Flowers, although Flowers is extremely explosive, is an absolute killer in that first round, Darius Flowers doesn't win minutes the same way Ferreira does, doesn't pose the same grappling success he does. Flowers is more so a power threat, a, a guy who's going to have early success or crumble down the stretch. And for that reason, I, I think it's a fight that is very, very winnable for Johnson. Now, I've seen Flowers give up if he's not able to get early success. I've seen him be able to crumble. And if he's able to fix that cardio and resiliency and ability to win fights, I think it'd be a true problem because he is powerful. I do think it's an underrounded ground game, explosive takedown entries. I think Flowers could have some success. But man, I don't like that cardio. I don't like that striking defense. I don't like that resiliency. And... If you're not able to get someone out of there early, you're going to fade down the stretch. Uh, a UFC vet like Johnson could take advantage of that. So at the end of the day, I do think this is a very, very close fight. And I was very close to picking Flowers before, but the more I watched tape, the more I realized that, kind of like Guskoff, he's not going to get that early knockout. He's going to lose this fight. And for that reason, I'm picking the older Michael Johnson. I do think he's able to weather the early storm, utilize his, his striking from range, and beat up on Flowers, win minutes and beat up on Flowers. And I think in doing so, gets his hand raised in the process, but man, I'm not betting on this. And if I was betting on Johnson, I'd be clenched. You know, Flowers does throw a fighting attention. We have seen Johnson knocked down. It is a scary proposition. I'm actually torn on this one. I do think it's a close one. And for that reason, although I'm picking Johnson, I think Flowers is a phenomenal drafting target. 7.9K, if he wins this fight, it's going to be early. It's going to be pretty violent and it's going to score very well. 7.9K in underdog, I do think has a high ceiling. I actually like it more than Johnson because when Johnson wins, it hasn't always been too pretty. In his last wins, he scored 64 76 and 64 you know what i am much more prefer flowers on the drafting side of things but gun to my head i will pick michael johnson as the preferred winner in this match because hand raised but it is very close should be a fun one flowers on DraftKings though next up 28 brad tavares 14 and 5 gregory rodriguez two untrustworthy guys but should make for a very very fun fight and uh gregory rodriguez is a guy who i think has all the tools but doesn't always grapple and his chin is questionable i think he's a phenomenal offensive threat but struggles defensively, and uh, you know what? That's dangerous. Luckily for him, he's facing a guy, Brad Tavares, who isn't really that dangerous. So it allows him to have some leeway here. Brad Tavares, a very good decision winner, great takedown defense, good pace, great cardio, good volume and pressure on the feet as well. And I think when it comes down to a fight that Tavares has to win, it's usually a minute winning decision based uh, affair here, whereas Rodriguez is typically that finisher. And I, and I think when it comes down to looking at this fight as a whole, I have to pick Rodriguez. I think he has the far superior ground game to have some success there. And I do think that on the feet, although Tavares is going to have potential minute winning ability, Rodriguez has power. We've seen Tavares's chin crack before, and I do think Rodriguez is going to try to bull rush forward and have some success. Now, am I parlaying or playing Rodriguez at this price tag? Definitely not. He's not trustworthy. And though Brad Tavares isn't either, I, I, I just, I can't go out there and rely on that too often. I do think he could not utilize his wrestling or he could not fight the best of his abilities, which could make it for a dangerous spot here. But DraftKings wise, I'm all over it. 9.1K, if Rodriguez wins this fight, is typically going to be very, very violent. Ground success potentially, knockout upside there for sure. 
He scored over 100 points in uh, three of his last four wins. And in the one where he didn't score 100, he scored 98, right? A ton of upside. Very, very violent affair. And I do think Gregor Rodriguez gets his hand raised here in dominant fashion. However, if you're looking for an underdog, you're looking for the high upside, Brad Tavares has a path, right? You can outpoint Gregor Rodriguez, try to hit on that questionable chin, stop the takedowns, push a pace, and in doing so, could be a sneaky underdog. Doesn't always score well in drafting, so I'm not getting to him there. However, like I mentioned, Rodriguez isn't the safest, so I'm not really going out there and parlaying him, just playing a little bit of devil's advocate, but I do really like Rodriguez. 9.1K, high ceiling, finish upside, decent drafting target. Next up, we have ourselves a short notice replacement, the 25 Eo Pateria versus the 17 and 5 Robert Brischeck. Um, Sure, let's go with that. Not much to say about this one. I do not like Eero Pateria. I've been over this a thousand times. Thinks a bit of a fraud. He's been outed a bit recently, but he had a great performance last time. I made a lot of money betting against him, and I'm looking forward to continuing to doing that, but this is a wild fight. Pateria dropping down in weight on short notice to face a powerful guy in Bristrick here. A guy who I don't think is that talented. He's not going to be winning too many minutes or too many five-round decisions anytime soon, but a guy who just walks forward and destroys people. A ton of power. Like, I, I have not seen much from Bristrick on the ground. He's fought horrible level of competition. I don't like his cardio but he's won 11 of his 17 fights by knockout, is extremely dangerous, has a ton of power in those hands, and will walk forward. He will bush, bull rush you to get that finish. So it's a, it's a really weird one, and I typically want to continue the Pateria fade. I, I think that his chin's there to be hit. I don't like his striking defense. I don't like his cardio, but he, he's lost these fights to guys who I thought had multiple avenues over him, a guy who could take him down, but also knock him out on the feet, a guy who could out-cardio him. But now, your Pateria is going to be a big dude here, with pretty good striking boxing and who's fought better level of competition, I, I really am tempted on Eero Pateria this week as an underdog. Now, am I going to bet it? No, I'm not betting on bad fighters here in this spot, but I do think he's a sneaky underdog. I mean, um, no price tags out right now, but I think he'd be sneaky because it, we've seen Bruce Check drop. We've seen him lose fights before. He's fought low level of competition. If Pateria wins, it's probably early KO success. I mean, he's proven that he could land power and knock guys down like he did in his last bout, but... I don't know. I'm going to have to see the weight cut, see how that transpires. I'm going to see how Brishek is able to, to push a pace. I, I, do, don't, I don't doubt it at all that Brishek is going to come forward and look to, to knock off Pateria's head. But if Pateria can like, counter strikes, continue to push forward, throw some adversity to Brishek, I do think Pateria could have some success here. And I do think he could be a very sneaky play on DraftKings. Out of this fight as a whole, I want some of it. I think the winner scores very well because they're both going to look for early KO success and both guys will fade after that. I do think it ends very early and violently, so I want both sides. But if I think it's a close, almost toss-up fight, give me the underdog on DraftKings in a very, very close one. With that being said, gun to my head. At this point in time, I'm anticipating Pateria to look weird in the scales, dropping down to weight, so I'm picking Brist check. However, this pick might change come weigh-ins, come face-offs. If I see something I, I, I might like, I might switch the underdog here to Pateria, but really weird one. I'm looking to download information to see more about on DraftKings, one of my favorite fights in the sleep. Co-main event time, 7-7, seven seven, Dan Ige versus the 23-10, and 10, Andre Feely. Phenomenal fight. It's going to be an incredible striking affair. And honestly, a pretty easy one to break down considering how much data we have on these guys and how fun it's going to be. I think it's going to be, like I mentioned, a 15-minute striking affair where Feely will have the height and reach discrepancy, but the hand speed of Ige, he's finally getting a matchup he likes. And I got to go with 50K here. I mean, we've seen Ige lose fights. I mean, he was taken down by Mitchell. He was taken down by Vloyd. He was even taken down and back controlled by a Korean zombie. But when he gets these striking affairs, when he's able to go out there and stand and bang, he has a ton of success. I mean, he beat Barbosa going in close. He showed power against Jackson and Tucker. I mean, the guy's a phenomenal striker. And he finally has the ability to showcase that in what should be a phenomenal striking affair of 15 minutes. Now, the height and reach on Feely, I completely understand that. But the hand speed for Ige, better level of competition more experience, and I do think he has the ability to go out there and, and really contend. Uh, I think that I that in most striking affairs, I'm going to favor a guy like Dan Ige. And although Feely has the ability to potentially scramble for takedowns and utilize that range, I think the better overall striker with more volume, who's going to be on the front foot, who's also the more trustworthy, durable fight of the two here, is going to be Dan Ige. He's going to be my pick to win. Super, super fun fight. On DraftKings, though, I'm going to go other places, right? This is, like I mentioned, a 15-minute striking affair where the winner is probably just going to have Strikes landed and a decision win. If that's the case, Ige scored 76 against Landweir, 74 against Barbosa, 58 against Bektik in those decision wins. When he's knocking in the knockout, he's not always scoring the best. And for that reason, I don't want this fight too often on DraftKings. I do think it's a fun one. However, considering I think it's going to be so entertaining, winner gets their hand raised by decision. I think there may be a better option with more finish upside on the slate. 
but I do think Danny Gay is very good in cash. And finally, the main event, the 12 and two Joe Piper versus the 23 and eight Jack Hermanson. Super, super fun fight. You guys know I love Joe Piper. Be Joe Piper, they said. And Joe Piper became Joe Piper. Yeah, he did. And you know what? The most money I've ever had in a fight in my entire life was Joe Pfeiffer. I had 10 units on him against, you know, the GOAT, Alan Amadovsky, in his debut. And um, whereas I don't think I'll ever be doing that again because that was stressful. Um, Pfeiffer's a guy I really, really like here, man. I always like his style. He's going to go forward. He's a finisher at heart, very well rounded skill set on the mat, on the feet. He wants to go out there. He wants to take your head off. And, and I love that style. He's got a very entertaining style and a style that the UFC can promote. Now, what he's getting here is two things. Number one, a five rounder. We have not seen his cardio tested. We have not really seen him face adversity. He's also getting Jack Hermanson, a guy who is notoriously durable, a guy who is notoriously almost a gatekeeper at this point because he is so talented. There are gonna be a lot of questions answered about Joe Pfeiffer. Now, go into my head, I'm picking Joe Pfeiffer. Be Joe Pfeiffer, like I mentioned, more ways to get it done. I love his ability to contend the ground game. I love his power and volume on the feet. I do think he wins this fight. I also think that Jack Mint's getting up there in age. He's getting a bit slower and he can be hit. He can be countered. I think Joe Piper wins this fight. But if I'm sitting here and I'm telling you that I'm picking a guy in Piper whose last win was over Abdul Razak Al Hassan, and we've never seen Piper go five rounds, and his cardio and minute winning ability is already sketch, and he's fighting Jack Hermanson as a minus 250 favorite, I, I don't think that's going to I don't think that's crazy, man. I, I do not think that Piper should be this big of a favorite. I do think he wins, and I do think that. He should be favored, but to this extent, when there are so many questions to be answered about him, I have to really put my question mark on it. I, I don't really know if I can get them in the betting market. I do think Joe Piper wins this fight, but the line's wide. Jack Manson is no pushover. He's extremely durable, will push a pace, will have the better cardio, you'd think around two, around three, four, five. But also, great wrestling, ability to contend on the ground, has been notoriously durable as well. So I don't know, man. I think it's gonna be a lot closer in the line, of, uh, line and tails, but I am picking Joe Piper with more ways to get it done. DraftKings wise though, I'm all over Joe Pfeiffer. If he wins this fight, it's typically early and he scored 97, 96 and 105 in his three wins so far. He's got incredible takedowns. He's got very good power on the feet as well. And I do think he wins this fight. I think he's coming in prepared and I, and I do think that he has the ability to go out there and score very well. However, his ceiling is just higher than the rest. If you were to compare Joe Pfeiffer, grappling, finish upside guy versus Daniel Marcos, Loma Luke Bunmi, Balashioki, like he is the guy that stands out at 9K. Unfortunately, he's gonna be very, very popular because of it, but I do think he wins. I do think he's a phenomenal drafting option and I am playing into the popularity this week. I'm picking him. However, like I mentioned, if Jack is gonna keep it close, I think this line's wide, I'm gonna have my fair share of him too at 7.2K. I mean, he's no slouch, he's no pushover. We haven't seen him finish early that often. And I do think he's able to contend. So I'm picking Piper. I think the line is wide. And for that reason, having exposure on both sides, Jack Hermanson at 7.2K allows for a ton of options up top to get to the protest, to get to the Rodriguez. I do think it's a, a very, very fun fight. One that I'm looking forward to very much to see if Joe Piper can pass the test. I hope he can, I'm picking him to do so. But until I see that proven to me, this line's wide and I don't think I'll be paying or parlaying Joe Piper on this price tag. But that's gonna do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm quickly running through my quick picks. I'm taking Joe Piper, Dan Ige, for now, Robert Brischeck, Gregor Rodriguez, Michael Johnson, Rodolfo Vieira, Carlos Protes, Timothy Kwamba, Loma Lukbunmi, Devin Clark, Jeremiah Wells, Zach Pioga, Haider Emil, and Daniel Marcos. Draftings wise, I hate this top range. And there are some still some salaries to come out, so keep that in mind. But when it comes to fight to targeting, targeting that main event, Piper Hermanson, I'm targeting that mid-range, Vieira versus Petrosian, Pateria versus Brischek, and even some Pauga versus Guskov. Splitting it up by range up top. I love Protez, love Rodriguez, love Piper. Mid-range, I think Clark has some viability. I think Pauga is a very sneaky option as well. And I do like Vieira. Underdog-wise, I'm going to love Kuamba. I love Guskov for upside. I don't think he wins, but I do think he has good GPP upside. Same thing with Flowers. I also think that down low, if you're looking for GPP upside, Giles is a phenomenal GPP underdog. And Fernie Garcia should be a dart throw this week. Cash-wise, Hermanson, Kuambo, those are the two I'm going towards. Betting-wise, only one bet locked in right now, four units. Carlos protest minus 200. I will be adding some Kwamba. I will be looking at potentially some unders here or some spots or another, but those are the only two things I have so far, or only one thing I have so far will be the other thing. Well, I will be betting for sure. If you want to know more of my bets, check out my best bets video. It should be out later in the week, sponsored by CoolBet or my Twitter at Gambles Gordo. Full betting card should be posted Saturday morning. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. Hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. Show some love. I wish everyone all the best in all your betting and drafting endeavors this weekend. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. Wish everyone the best of luck. Let's make some money, guys.